Hello, I'm Mary Ito, and welcome to the CRAM Podcast. CRAM is an acronym for Communicating Research and More, which is what we try and do on this podcast. A lot of exciting research and groundbreaking ideas never reach the public, but they have the potential to change the way we think and act. One of the fundamental questions of humans has always been, who am I? To know our identity and where we came from has been a powerful driving force in all of us. In her book, Kinovit, Norma Dunning writes about a past and an identity that her family never spoke about, being Inuit. But as she grew older, the question of, who am I, became stronger. She spent years doing research to find out more about her Inuit heritage the culture, the traditions, and the people she was connected to. But she also came across practices of a colonial system that had devastating consequences for her ancestors, the impact which can still be felt today. Norma Dunning is an assistant lecturer in the Faculty of Education at the University of Alberta. She's the author of several books, including Taina, The Unseen Ones, which received the Governor's General Award in 2021. Her latest book is called Kinovit, What's Your Name? the Eskimo disc system, and a daughter's search for her grandmother. And she joins us. Hello, Norma. Thanks for coming on our podcast. Hello. Thank you, Mary. It's an honor to be here with you. Um, Yeah, I want to go back and talk about your childhood and the fact that you never knew about your Inuit heritage growing up because it was not spoken about. And in fact, you were told that you were French. Why did your (laughs) mom not want to speak about it? Well, I think we really have to, and I, and I believe it takes us a little bit of time. And I mean, in our own, you know, maturing process, where we begin to um, examine the lives of our own parents. You know, when we're coming up, I don't think we give it as much thought as we should. But uh, for myself, I think, you know, for my mother, she survived eight years in a residential school along with two of her sisters. And it was during that time that uh, in Nuktituk, you know, you were not allowed to speak it. And instead, she was fluent. Well, she was fluent in Inuktitut, but also English and French. And I think from that experience and uh, that a great deal of um, how she operated in the world became silenced. And and it just was uh, not something that we talked about when we were growing up. But it took me many years to really spend time thinking about her and how she how she functioned in the world and I think that often Indigenous parents will protect their children by not telling them exactly what they are. And a part of that is how the world still manages to look at Indigenous Canadians and how we are handled, you know, through government and various policy. So, that, you know, it took me years, though, to figure her out. And mm. uh, I mean, she was wonderful. I adored her. I still adore her. <laughs> and um, and she is often the impetus of, of what I write. How, how was it that you came to the conclusion that you were mm-hmm. Inuit? Well, that had to do with auntie (laughs) and auntie would come to visit and she would have these conversations that my mother would, you know, try to silence. Mm. So, you know, in around when I was around 16, I started to hear these bits and pieces. Uh, And then, then it's trying to put it together like a puzzle is what it became. And, so little tiny amounts of information would come out. And and then it was, you know, keeping keeping that inside of myself somehow. And then, you know, there came a time, there came a time where it was important for me, I felt, and my three sons to apply to Nunavut for 
known for beneficiary status. And, and that's where at that point, that's where Kenobi takes off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I was fascinated by, well, um, your journey had so many facets to it. I mean, you spent years doing research into mm-hmm. your past. Um, mm-hmm. but also at the same time, uh, you were going to school. Uh, you decided at the age of almost 51, to go to mm-hmm. university. What, what, yeah. Why? What prompted that? Unemployment. <laughs> I wish I could say something, you know, really intelligent right now, but it honestly was, it was unemployment. And when my oldest son had made application to Grant McEwen and I was helping him fill out his forms. And I, you know, I, I had never, ever been unemployed and, and I thought, you know, buddy, yeah, I get to do that too. I get to try that. And every year that I was in university, it was all based on whether or not I'd have enough money to, <laughs> to make it through. And I was very fortunate. You know, I was, um, I applied for and received many wonderful scholarships, but I worked hard at it and, um, and I always had to carry two or three jobs outside of uh, attending university. Mm. You made all kinds of discoveries um, when you were doing your research. And, and one that I, I didn't realize myself was um, how being Inuit was different mm-hmm from being First Nations or Métis, as far as being recognized by the government. Can you talk about that? Well, Inuit are not members of the Indian Act. And so, and the government of Canada never had a specific act that applied to Inuit. And I always, you know, I always think we were just sort of left off and, um, you know, out of sight, out of mind, that kind of uh, attitude. And I think that attitude persists into present day. And so, you know, as I'm doing this kind of research, then I, aside from being able to really investigate the Eskimo Identification Canada system, I was also accessing various policies and different um, different kinds of colonialism that arrived into the north so very much later than in the rest of Canada. And it it was uh, like sometimes I would get a little upset about it because often I think Inuit were not, you know, were not given a fair shake. And when we look at disparities in the North right now and how, uh, you know, food insecurity is so extreme and the, the rate of tuberculosis still thrives in the North and we don't have it as much, if at all, in the South. And just the, you know, the, the day-to-day kinds of things like the cost of, we think, the cost of food is high right now. But believe me, up there, it's, it's even more. And, and so I always feel that, um, you know, Inuit weren't taken care of in the same way. But that is also contingent on each of the land claims and how government negotiated each and every right. one of those claims. And with Nunavut, that was a 20-year process by the time the land claim is signed. But signing is only the beginning because now you have to have implementation. And one of the things uh, the government of that day did was um, they basically said, you know, uh, we, we will negotiate land and resources. But when it comes to any kind of fiduciary obligation through government, you each, each of these lands claims have to go out, form a corporation, and that's who we deal with. And so that's the, you know, that's the way it went. And, um, and so even I think through that lands claim, Inuit are still very much, uh, 
undercared for. Mm. Yeah, I, I thought it was ironic, not in a good way, mm. that on the one hand, as you say, um, they were ignored. Uh, they, they weren't even recognized by the government. Um, mm. They weren't part of any treaty negotiations, no. right? Just, I believe, mm. the one you mentioned in the book in Labrador. Right. And yet, on the other hand, there was this Eskimo disk system in which right. every Inuit had to be accounted for, right? That's right. Can you, can you talk about that disk system? Well, when we, like you said, Mary, um, the government of Canada has never defined the word Inuit. And um, there was an Inuit man here in Edmonton who has since passed on. His name was Kiviak. And uh, one of the things he fought for was to try to get the government to define what is Inuit. And he would say, you know, they can define what my dog is, but they can't define me. He was actually Canada's first Inuk uh, lawyer. So he was, uh, he was quite somebody. But when we think of it, when we think of how through this neglect and through this not wanting to have to deal with Inuit people, it all begins in around 1939 with the Supreme Court of Canada case. It's called Re-Eskimo, Our Eskimos Indians. And it, it was decided through that case that, you know what, the government did have to accept obligation towards the Inuit people. And so that is like the early beginnings. And at that time, the government drew up all these districts in the north. And so on the, on the west side, it, it'll only go W, W1 through 4. And on the east side, it'll go E1 to 14. And now, now the administrators have to come into the north and figure out, you know, what is this population? So as doctors, missionaries, and administration people are coming in, there's a huge difficulty with Inuit names. And the names were singular. They were not gendered names. And so the, when the colonizer is coming along, the, they're not understanding, you know, how to spell the names, how to say the names. And so for their own convenience, and um, because 1941 was a decennial year, census taking, they decide to implement the Eskimo Identification Canada system. So in that process, the people who were the census takers, they initially roll out that first rendering of the disc, and every Inuit person in the north was given one. And, and that, th this disc, what did it look like? It, it, it's only about the size of a quarter. It's really quite small, and it's like a, a harder fiber. I will not say it's plastic. It's like a harder fiber. Mm -hmm. And initially, there was so much discussion about, well, what should we put on the disc aside from the numbers? And there was, you know, talk about, oh, maybe we should put the bison. And then they realized, well, Inuit, that the bison are nowhere in the Arctic. So, mm -hmm. oh, okay, we're not going to do that. And instead, they, the initial rollout of the discs has a crown in the middle. And I do talk about um, this one interaction between uh, Inuit in Nunutsiavut in Labrador, and they're being told, you know, by this non-Inuit man, there is a, a great, great person who lives across the ocean, and they are here to take care of you. And, and he gives this really big, long-winded kind of speech. And at the end of it all, each of the Inuit men were given a pair of woolen underwear. <laughs> so that was like a gifting. <laughs> but, um, and Inuit were stunned by it. 
because mm. by that time, Inuit did wear, you know, Western style clothing. But in all of this, so you can see as an example, how confusing it was not for Inuit, but for the people who have been sent through government into the North. And their solution was to just number everybody and then it'll be simple. Mm -hmm. And because Inuit did not travel in huge numbers together, they could not be treated the way First Nations were treated at treaty time and where different kinds of checks could be made onto the First Nations population in Canada. They mm -hmm. could not do that with Inuit. So instead, everybody's given this number, they are told it must be on your person at all times. Right. And that number over time became this very heavy, heavy form of surveillance, whereby uh, Inuit being tracked by that number, that's how your number is what uh, allowed you to do commerce. So whether it was trading your furs at a post or going into a store and making a purchase, that would be recorded. And then whether when you're going to school, the children were called out by their number and not their name. They're not their name yeah. And D can I just stop it, you for a sec? Yeah, I, I yeah. just I'm so glad you're bringing up how essential um, mm -hmm. mandatory, really right mandatory right. to their existence was mm -hmm. this number, just in case people think, oh, well, you know, uh, First Nations had a number and maybe this right. number was just like, you know, mm -hmm. your your SIN number that we have today, right. you know, but right. it was far yeah. different. Far different, very, very different. Thank you, Mary, for bringing up that point because over time, this number evolves into a very, very heavy form of surveillance. And it's actually a, a way to control a population. So how do you control it? How do you um, put biopower out into the world? You do it in a similar fashion, whereby you're really wanting to keep a, a heavy hand on that population, what they are doing, what they're able to purchase, whether or not they are in school, whether or not they can have access to health care. And those are things that all Canadians had without a DISC mm -hmm. number. And you have to keep in mind that Inuit also had social insurance numbers. And um, a common response that I get, which is too bad, is, well, nobody died. And apparently... Death. <laughs> Death is what makes something, you know, much more, um, I don't know, viable or I have no, you know, of interest. But what we have to think about is through that numbering, the traditional naming system is interrupted and then mm -hmm. the ceremony of death. So within Inuit groupings, when somebody had passed away, the next child born was named after that person. Now, if the person had passed away, was a very good hunter, when, and the next child born is a girl, the girl would be given his name and taught to become a very good hunter. At the same time, through the, the transferring of the name, the person who had passed away was able to settle in an afterlife. And for Inuit, we had four different lands. And so they would, um, I guess, the equivalent of heaven or how people think of heaven. And, and that was very important that a soul was at rest. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that when you think about now being given this number through the DISC system, and that naming system is stopped. It, it's basically yeah. stopping a whole, a, a legacy that you've inherited. Mm -hmm. Your history becomes stopped, right? Right. 
Right. Very much, Mary. It's yeah. a huge interruption. Yeah. It's huge. A huge, so, huge. Yeah. I, I mean, I have to wonder how did how did the Inuit at the time feel about this? Uh, you know, like Inuit don't get uh, on long rants about too much of anything. <laughs> but I will say, I believe, you know, the the earlier encounters, I thought that um, the Inuit presented with fear. They were so afraid that they would be put into jail if they did not have that number on them. And, and then I've had other people, other Inuit say something to the effect of, well, you know, you know, those non-Inuit, we had to help them because they couldn't figure out our names. So therefore, we had to carry those discs. But at the same time, as the uh, disc system is coming embedded within Inuit society, Inuit are being told no more traditional names, no more. Mm -hmm. You have to take up Christian biblical names. And so we, we can still see that in the North where we have older names that are really, you know, from the Bible that you don't see anyplace else. Names like Zebedee. You know, how many Zebedees has anybody ever met? <laughs> None. <laughs> Actually, you know what? You're right. Because the Zebedee <clears throat> that you refer to, Zebedee yes. Nungak in the book, yep. yes. and he's, a, he's quite a, he's a prominent uh, Inuk, <laughs> isn't he? Yeah. He is. And, and, he and is. you know what? It, it, since you bring him up, it, it, it is interesting because talking about the different responses that people <laughs> had to the disc system and... Right. You know, you said in the book that, I mean, some of them just accepted it. Um, some of them, I guess, yes, were, were absolutely fearful about the repercussions of it. And some of them even were, I guess they felt it was just part of their identity. And they mm -hmm. even viewed it with a kind of affection. <laughs> I which think, I thought was um, it, yeah. Yeah, well, I think over time it becomes so normalized that you have this number as well mm -hmm. as um, a biblical Christian name. And, uh, and, you know, and we have to remember, too, that as the, the system is being dismantled, that's when Project Surname goes into the north and everyone is told, well, now you need a last name. But what happened is you could have a mother, father, couple of kids, 12 dogs, <laughs> and um, each, the mom, dad, and the children would each have a different last name. So once all of that information gets back to Ottawa, they create after the DISC system, after Project Surname, they create Project Correction. And again, up into the north, and everyone is being told you have to have under one roof that same last name. And so it's this, this whole mashing and smashing mm. of, of Inuit tradition. And, uh, and, and then I believe it, it takes until the mid nineties for the government of Canada to figure out, okay, these are the people who live up there. And, um, you know, by that time, somebody like David Sigorgak, who interviewed with me, he had told me that you know, first there were the, the disc numbers, and then it was having to have this biblical Christian first name. And when it came to his last name, he chose his uncle's first name, Sergorgak. So the, he chose that as a last name. And then he said he went out, he hired a lawyer, he had all of his documents changed over to David Sergorgak. And and that, and he just felt like, you know, they're not going to do anything else with me or my name. And it's, um, it's this very long drawn out colonialism that just, yeah. it, you know, and it's, it and just it's confusing. Lingered. 
I, I find it, I found it, I can only imagine reading about it. I was, I found it confusing. I can't imagine <laughs> what it was like to be Inuit and having to go mm-hmm. through this. And, and also, yeah. do you know, I mean, when you talk about the losing of these traditions, um, mm-hmm. also lost was the tradition of tattooing, which was yes. so important to, to, to yeah. the women. Can you right. talk about that? Sure. Um, only, only women tattooed, men did not tattoo. And there has been a resurgence of tattooing by Inuit women, probably more so in the last eight years. Mm. But what would happen for, I'm Pad Layanuk, so had I been, you know, born in the North at that time, um, at around age three, the girls would begin to be tattooed. And it was running caribou sinew through a kudlik from and getting the ash from the lamp and uh, having the tattoo markings stitched onto your face, onto your hands, in your forearms and thighs. But to think the tradition behind all of that is that the mother's lines, you know, the lines on her face and on her hands, etc., would be transferred to the girls. And then as the girl is going through her life, she adds different tattoos. And so basically, you know, the, the female body was like a, a map and a genealogy of that, that woman's her own life, but also that of her mother and her grandmother and her great grandmother. So it was this um, beautiful, I think, gorgeous way of uh, maintaining personal history. Mm-hmm. I I read too about um, the tattoos on the woman's inner thighs and the significance of when a baby is born. That's right. I thought that That's was right. so beautiful. Can, can you ex- explain what that it's is It's just about? gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. Um, so the, the thighs are tattooed to have the baby, when the baby is being born, to, to come into like this calm, peaceful kind of uh, existence. And generally, the um, parents would be there at the birth, and they begin to chant that baby's name. So that's so they that's what the baby is hearing during the the course of of labor, and one of the things uh, about the girls and women being tattooed is you know they were told if you do not tattoo, you will not go to heaven, and you know one of the lands, and um, and therefore they would end up in a state of like purgatory where where they're just like leaning forward and all they're doing is blowing smoke out of their lungs and then as their ancestors who are already there and the ones who are coming in they see them in this state of i don't know limbo i guess Mm. So there's all these beautiful stories that intersect with the, the traditions. And, but women in the North and Inuit women, they've, there is a resurgence of tattooing. Oh, yeah. So, so that the, the history in the past can live again right. uh, and yes. be carried on. Yeah. yeah. Right. Do you know right. one thing you said earlier, which, yeah, I, I think I, I'd like to bring up is, you said that some people um, with regards to uh, the DISC system have said, well, nobody died from that. But, you know, is there not an argument there that people, in fact, Inuit did die, not directly Mm -hmm. because they had a number, but indirectly Mm -hmm. from the number being a part of the whole colonial system, uh, including the relocation of Inuit Mm -hmm. as well? Right. which resulted in tra- tragedy, which did result in deaths. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Padlai, for my Inuit, historically, they were uh, relocated five times. And each relocation, somebody would arrive with a, you know, a seaplane and gather them up. You had the clothing on your back. That's it. 
and you were literally flown and dropped. And, and, and why the were they relocated? Why were the Padlai relocated? Well, along with other Inuit as well, the the relocations have to do with sovereignty of the north. And that is still a bit of an argument that goes on today where Greenland and Russia, there's about a 350-mile strip of land where there's various flags, you know, have been posted in there, stuck into the land and people saying, well, this is ours. And um, so it had to do with that. It had to do with um, especially the ending of World War II. And there was a great fear uh, out of the U.S. that the Russians would invade through Canada and then into the States. And so there, you know, there was a, a military presence that was taken up in the north. There were several uh, different kind of kind of uh, expeditions that were done, so the military could have practice. <laughs> and but you know, so you have all this kind of activity that hits all at once, and. And what Inuit will say is, you know, colonization in the North was later, faster. And when we look at education, the government never took responsibility for educating Inuit until 1955, which isn't that long ago. And there's so many other, like, just layers and layers and layers of colonial policy that is happening at a rapid pace. I don't like to think of everything being lost. And when I teach what I teach, I do not and will not teach from a point of loss because I hear it too much about how all Indigenous Canadians have lost their tradition and their language. And you know what? We're still breathing. That's our biggest act of resistance. We're still here. We're still breathing. And there's huge revitalization in terms of language and culture. And, you know, I teach some students who will say, well, my grandma never taught me or, you know, that it's almost like their excuse. And I will say to them, you have to go find it. You know, you, you don't have to, you, you can't put that kind of an expectation onto a grandparent. You have to go out there and get it. And, and I think in a way, you know, then we earn it, you know, we're actually earning it. <laughs> so, so I never, ever teach, you know, from a, a point yeah. of loss, I never will. Yeah, I, I, I know you said that and I, I did find that concept yeah, intriguing, because um, l loss has such a finality to it, doesn't it? Right. Whereas when yeah. you talk about an interruption, it it mm -hmm. implies a, a future that mm -hmm. something is carried on, but there's just been yeah. a, a sort of a stop, a gap, a break. Right. Right. And in in around the 1950s, drum dancing was outlawed in the north. And when Inuit came together and had drum dance, that was a time of prayer, a time of visiting, a time of giving thanks to the earth and to the spirits. And, and then, you know, we are told, like, that's it. You're going to jail if you do this. What we always have to remember is there would be factions of Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people who still practice the tradition, but would just go off into a place further away. And so to me, like there was always that transcendence that was happening. And one of the things that I had to do personally was spend a great deal of time thinking about how my mother taught me how, um, how she interacted with the world, but also with me and how I was taught, you know, certain things as I'm coming up. And I, I think that's why, you know, when I open by saying you have to have a bit of maturity before, 
you begin to think about, well, what made my parents the way that they mm-hmm. were? Mm-hmm. And, and so to me, like we can pass on tradition without any real formality. And, and it isn't like my mom ever said, Hey, Norma, come here. I'm going to teach you how to be a good little Inuit girl. <laughs> like she never ever did that. Right. But she showed me, she showed me. And that's what you look for. Like, how do we learn by uh, somebody modeling a behavior? You know, how do we, how do we take it in and how do we keep it with us? A couple of months ago, I did an interview with another researcher, um, quite a renowned researcher of education um, who studies um, the development uh, in children, developmental psychology. And he said exactly what you said, that, yeah, that parents can say all they want, that you need Mm -hmm. to do this and you should do this and this is the right way of doing things. But if the children don't actually see that behavior modeled, Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not as effective. Not expected. That's right. Yeah. And this is something that, you know, the Inuit carried as their, as, as their wisdom. They didn't need a study or, you know, (laughs) to, to know this, you know, (laughs) we did not have a child psychologist. No, exactly. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Do you, um, and, and, you know, I just want to go back to the, all this research that you were doing. Right. Um, it was also based on your own personal um, wish to find out about your grandmother, right. yeah. the grandmother you didn't know, right? The Inuit no. grandmother you didn't know. No. No, she, uh, and Gapniak was her name, and uh, she lives inside of my head as a very beautiful Inuk woman. I have no idea what she would have looked like. Um, mm. But I, I know I'll always you know, spend time reading disc lists and uh, trying to find her. I know I will. Yeah. And it's, well, it's now, very why do you difficult. Think you, can I ask you, yeah, why do you think it was that you couldn't find her? I mean, with all the research you did and looking into historical records and, and studying the Eskimo disk system, why do you think she eluded you? It has to do with uh, the amount of redaction that is uh, on each of the disk lists. And the RCMP gathered that information, sent it off to Ottawa, and it, you know, it, it was held there. And when I requested, I was very fortunate. There's a gentleman, Mr. Atchison, at the Prince of Wales um, archives. And I had contacted him and said, you know, I I would like the disc list from these years to these years in this area. And he came back and he said, Norma, this is what they're going to look like. So it would be a column with a disc number, the name redacted out, the uh, position in the family, mother, father, child, son, daughter, and then the, um, the uh, approximate date of birth, which would be redacted, and then where. So basically, I would have a number and a location. I wouldn't have a name. And um, and he had said to me, you know, if you want me to, I'll run off like 50 different lists for you, but you're really getting nothing. And he sent me, you know, a copy of what what information would be available. So it's heavily redacted. And I don't know. I don't know if uh, there were people who who lived in the North, like the early years of the system, and they would write down disc lists and names. So, you know, it's it's like an administrator who did a private scribbler that, you know, where they put everybody's disc number and their name. And and that information is um, 
I know that there's some sitting at the University of Saskatchewan. I don't know if I'll ever get there. <laughs> but, no? but, you know, I will always look for her. I know I will. Mm -hmm. I know I will. What, when was the DISC system finally eliminated? Oh, officially 1971. But... Um, but when you when you look at project surname and project correction, you know we might as well say 1995. Uh, one of the there was an Inuk man who was the first member of parliament, and he gave a very long speech. And what he had said is to I would like the disc system stopped because I'm tired of getting my mail with a number instead of my name. But he gave a very, very long speech. And when I look for it through the National Archives, so much of that speech has been redacted. And so there you can see where, where government keeps control of specific information. And um, and in a way, it could be a bit of a protection towards Inuit in one way, but um, it, it is very hard information to get a hold of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, your I feel your book is so so important because I didn't know about the disc uh -huh. system. Uh, mm -hmm. I've I've talked to a, a number of people since I've read your book. They didn't know about it. We weren't taught about it. Well, we were taught very little about any weight in school, um, right. let alone the DISC system. But I think that's probably true even for you, right? When you teach classes, mm -hmm. you teach a lot of young people. I'm sure many yeah. of them had no idea about this. Most do not. Um, and, and it's because nobody ever really sat down and just tried to gather as much as they could about it. There's very, very small mentionings, uh, with Frank Tester and Peter Kolchinsky and, um, their book is called Mistake. And they, they make a mention. And then Sheila Greiger, she, she wrote on the TB epidemic in the North. And she makes the mention. And so you can't find anything that's sort of cohesive mm -hmm. and, and pulled together in a way that would, would make sense. And I have had Inuit say to me, why did we have those numbers? You know, why? Why did we have it? Because what do you know as a child? You have your mother Generally, it was the mom who would present the necklace to the child when they're around four. And, and they're told, you know, you have to have this and memorize that number. So that's one of the first things that you would memorize yeah. as an Inuit child was that number before you went to school. Like it was so important, important that, yeah. that you had that, that number in your memory. Norma, what, what would you like to see happen at this point? Well, I would like to see government acknowledge it. And, um, I mean, we have government after government, and they apologize for everything. But in it all, like, at least an apology would be recognizing that harm was done. At least that. And um, I don't know if that will ever happen. Uh, I, I, you know, I've had people say to me, well, are you going to spearhead a movement? And no, I'm not. Like, any weed aren't like that. <laughs> so anyway, um, no, I'm not going to decide to walk to Ottawa. No. Um, <laughs> But I do think that, you know, that there, there are many, many Inuit who are former DISC holders and they are still alive today. Mm. So, you know, when we have a government who never acknowledged bringing in this system, when all of Canada goes to school and this system is nowhere in curriculum, then you know, can I expect the government to say, I'm sorry, 
I have no idea because I'm sure, I'm sure there are members of parliament that have no idea that this system existed. What about for you personally? I mean, I know in the book you said that you're not angry uh, despite everything that has happened. What has that left you, you know, feeling with? Like what, how do you feel about all this yourself personally? Uh, I feel stronger for it um, only because of the mountain of reading that I did and um, the information that I was able to to pull together. Um, I feel like this is a book that is, you know, my gift to all the Inuit of Canada so that so that we can all understand why, you know, this numbering system came into being. And I, I really, truly feel like it made me stronger. And I don't think that it wasn't, you know, it was not easy research and it was picky and it was really having to run into one barrier after another. But at the same time, there's something glorious in being able to create a book that will inform people. And that's, that's what I want. I want people to be informed. I think it's a gift to non-Inuit as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mary. I, I really enjoyed speaking with you again, Norma. Thank you so oh. much. Thank you, Mary. You're so kind to me. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Norma Dunning, she is an assistant lecturer in the Faculty of Education at the University of Alberta, and she is a Governor General's award-winning author as well. Her latest book is called Kinovit, What's Your Name? The Eskimo Disc System and a Daughter's Search for Her Grandmother. If you'd like to know more about Norma and her work, you can check out our show notes. That is it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed it, and we would really appreciate your support. So please rate our podcast and subscribe and follow us on social. At Cram Ideas is our handle. Our thanks to the Temerty Foundation for their generous support. Thank you for listening and see you back here again.